started. Um, so I am planning to do stochastic planning, which is essentially uh, using the value on policy iteration ideas that we learned from uh, MVPs, except for uh, uh, factored planning problems. Okay, so as I mentioned, I think at the time when we started doing MDPs, uh, most of the classical methods for MDPs were done at the atomic level. So you assume that the states are black boxes and you are talking about value and policy functions over them. And now we are interested actually in probabilistic version of the domains that we have seen for deterministic planning. So suppose you have blocks world, except blocks once in a while fall off. Okay, or uh, you have rocket, I mean, a, a movement world where you know when you try to go in one direction, sometimes you go into a different place once in a while. Okay, uh, and you want to be able to uh, a provide the representation for them. So in particular, we are interested um, in the action language. How do you deal with something like PDL, which was using um, strips representation, how do you generalize that so that you could um, represent stochastic planning problems. And then second of course is uh, how to solve the problems. Now solving of the problems, um, so in, in, in the context of, uh, in the context of uh, factored representations, there are at the minimum to make people happy you need to allow Uh, you need to allow them to give you the description of the problems and domains in the factored level. That means in terms of state variables and how the actions change the state variables. And, uh, but the more interesting question would be underlying the planner, you could always convert it into states. You know, a state is just happens to be a, an, inter, uh, an interpretation over state variables and then solve it using the classical MDP methods. Uh, what we will actually be seeing in this class and probably part of my class is uh, first how to represent it in factory representation and how to handle the much larger problems that you get now that uh, what looks like a polynomial sized domain in terms of state variables suddenly becomes a much larger domain when you think in terms of atomic representation. Okay. Um, so, uh, and then we'll do our discussion in the context of IPPC, which is International Probabilistic Planning Competition. Um, and then we'll talk about, you know, how the setup, how the competition was set up and what happened to the planners there, okay? Um, so, in terms of providing probabilistic features, um, you know, to extend PDDL to provide probabilistic features, they essentially wanted to support the following, they wanted to support actions with uh, uncertain effects um, and uh, they, did, they decided not to worry about durations for the actions. So they're still instantaneous actions except they have uncertain effects. Okay. Um, those are like the two important things and uh, to, to support representation of actions which have uncertain effects. Okay, so you need essentially factor representations. That means you want actions uh, whose preconditions are specified in terms of state variables, whose effects are specified in terms of the effect they have on the state variables. Okay, uh, the simplest idea, in fact, the most uh, useful thing to think about is base network representation. Okay, so we'll first look at what's called two slice, two time slice base networks. Okay, I think most of you know base networks from uh, 471. So you look at two time slice base networks. Those are essentially describing the action in terms of what would be the state in terms of its state variables before the action, what would be the state in terms of the state variables after the action. Okay, so rather than describe it in terms of states, they describe, you want to describe the action in terms of its effect on the state variables. As an example, so something like this. So suppose, so this is time t and this is time t plus 1 and you have a base network here. Uh, this by the way is an example from, uh, this is an example from Boutillier and Dean and Hanks paper on decision theoretic planning. Um, 
But the point is that here's a little robot scenario where it is supposed to go from mail room, take co you know coffee, and then give it to you in your office. Okay. So there are the, the the state variables are location, tidiness, mail present, robot has mail, coffee requests, robot has coffee. These are the state variables. Okay, and they are described as to what those state variables are supposed to stand for. And the actions that the, act, the, the, the robot can do are things like move clockwise, move counterclockwise, tidy the lab, pick up mail, get coffee, deliver mail, deliver coffee. Okay, and all of these English descriptions are provided here. Okay, now an, uh, a state in this, in this world is essentially one look, the value for location, value for tidiness, value for mail present, value for this, value for this, value for that. Okay, so in particular, since there are five location variables, five values for the location, and uh, degree of tidiness is five, so five times five, and then the mail, which is two, so 50 by now, and then robot has mail another 200, coffee request 200, um, 400. So you have 400 states in this representation. Okay. Um, and then, um, so you could essentially describe actions, of course, in terms of the state-to-state uh, -state transition matrices directly. Okay. And they would look like a huge 400 by 400 matrix. But you could also describe them in terms of if the state variables have certain values in time t, what would their values be in time t plus 1? Okay, this is ultimately what all of, all of reasoning with change is about, right? Situation calculus tells you um, what would be true in the state resulting from doing this action in the current situation. Okay, and uh, Strips was doing the same thing. And here, this is basically doing the same thing except in the context of um, distributions. That means you are saying what will be true after this state is a probability distribution over possible values. Okay, so in this particular case, uh, this can be, for example, this is a representation for delivering coffee. Okay, and the delivering coffee is saying that the delivering coffee depends only on these three state variables, essentially. Okay. And, and, and basically it depends on and changes only those three state variables. That's why in the, the, the base network you only have uh, those two. Okay, and so the, now even though there's a location here, location here, this is location T, this is location T plus one. And this is RHCT, RHCT plus one, CRT, CRT plus one. Those are different variables, okay. and. Uh, this structure of the base network is essentially telling you how the, uh, so for example, location is apparently affected only by the previous location. Now since this is a base network, what you are supposed to provide is a CPT for each of these nodes, a conditional probability table for each of these nodes, describing what its value is, uh, for uh, what's the probability that it will take a specific value given that its immediate parents have taken a particular configuration of values. Okay, so for example, this one will say, if location is uh, one of the five values to begin with, what is the probability that the location here would be one of the five values? For each such uh, valuation, what's the probability? That's what you're giving, okay? Um, and here, robot has coffee is actually, it's interesting, more interesting because you're saying robot has coffee depends not only on the location, and not only on whether or not it had coffee before, but whether or not, uh, what the value of the location is. Okay, and uh, so uh, this one is essentially saying, for example, that if the location is office and it had coffee before, then, um, the probability that it has coffee is zero, um, and the probability that it doesn't have coffee is one. Yes? From the table, it seems that whether or not the robot has coffee is independent of its current location. It's dependent on the prior location. Yeah. That, so it's basically, if it is in the office and it still has coffee in its hands, after delivering coffee, it no longer has coffee in its hands. 
See, the actions, in fact, in all these things, the value of the current state variables depend only on the value of the previous state variables. Okay. If you actually, one of the interesting questions is, um, if you had links from location to RHC, and, I mean location T to RHCT and RHCT to CRT, let's say, okay, or if you had links here, then what does that mean? I mean, you guys should know. I mean, those of you who have thought about reasoning with actions and change um, might know that those essentially mean intrastate axioms. That means there are correlations, there are probabilistic correlations within the state variables of a given state. And if you want to capture that, that's how you use those extra um, links. Okay? Here, of course, you are, you are not using, you are assuming that the valuation of these, if there is correlations between these, it's only coming through the parents. It's only coming through the previous um, uh, time slices variables. Okay, so now when you specify a variable, when you specify, so, so specifying the deliver coffee action involves specifying the topology of this network and the CPT <coughs> of this network. This is what it means to provide the action description. It's a very general description. Okay, um, and then in fact, even these CPTs actually, you could say that these CPTs right now are written as tabular, tabular fashion. You can, if you remember the base network discussions, you could also compact, compress the base network uh, CPTs by, um, by essentially representing these as some sort of a parameterized form, in some sort of a parameterized form. So a conditional probability, let's say, is a Gaussian. That means instead of writing infinite number of numbers, you are just giving a formula. If it's a noisy R, instead of writing exponential number of numbers, you are just giving linear number of probabilities. Okay? And if it's neither of those, if it's neither, I mean, so of course, Gaussians, we don't even talk about right now because we are assuming these are all discrete variables. Okay? Let's say it's not noisy R, then what can I do with this CPT? One idea could be that you could represent the CPT using some structured uh, diagram. Okay, this one, these things are called um, ADDs, algebraic decision diagrams. Okay, and all this is basically saying is you start with location. If location is off, um, if location is off, is then you care about whether you know, robot has coffee. If the robot has coffee, then you care about whatever CR is, what is CR? Coffee request. Okay, coffee request. And if there is a coffee request uh, is true, then basically the probability that you have the coffee, I mean, that there is a coffee request left, I guess this is this one, coffee request left is 0 0.05. Okay, so you are writing this entire table more compactly, hopefully, as an ADD. So, um, one of the advantages then is that when you are, one interesting question is if you have this kind of a base network representation for actions and I just have two actions done one after other, then essentially I have a bigger base network from time t to time t plus 2, which is a concatenation of the two base networks, right? And the CPTs for the bigger base network can be computed from the CPTs of the smaller ones. So what we talk about as projection of strips actions in normal deterministic planning becomes concatenation of dynamic base networks here. And then so if you are into it, then you could essentially um, combine the, you, you, you would basically be combining, ultimately what you would have to do is combine these tables, uh, but you could write that as an action of combining the ADDs. Okay. By the way, this ADD representation is useful um, uh, for both CPTs and also for reward functions and also for value functions. Okay, uh, so we might at some point of time talk a little bit more about you know algebraic decision diagrams and you know how to learn them and how to um, how to convert to and from ADDs and how to do uh, manipulations on them. But you know that's one way of understanding. Uh, this much at least you should understand that you are writing a 2 tbn okay, and then the CPTs for the 2 tbn 
if they don't have much of a structure, then at least you will find as much structure as possible using the, uh, you know, ADDs. Okay, um, so that's for that's a more general representation. Um, one other idea that you can do is you could say, well, I don't really so. So the first idea is write a base network relating the value of fluence at the state before and after the action, and these would be the two time slice dynamic base networks. Okay, we can go further by using strips assumption, which basically say that you know fluents that are not represented by the action, not affected by the action, don't appear in the action description. And furthermore, every fluent that is affected by the action appears explicitly in the action description. Okay, and so if you do that, that's called the probabilistic strips operators. And the probabilistic strips operators can be thought of essentially as compiling this into what are all the possible, possible complete effect sets and what is their probability. Okay, so the idea is if I do this action at the end, I can have location to be one of the four values, RHC to be either false or true, and uh, CR to be either false or true. Okay, so five times two times two, 20 possible effect sets are there. Right, 20 possible effect sets are there for this action. The question is for each effect set, what is the probability? Notice that these effect sets are all essentially disjoint. Okay, when you did this action, if it turns out location is the fourth location, RHC is true, CR is false, that's one specific execution of this action. A different execution would be location is something else, RHC is true and CR is false. So all I want to do is rather than compute each variable's valuation separately, I want to compute effect sets together and their probabilities. Okay, and that's the probabilistic strips operator description and it looks like this. So for example, if a robot has coffee and the location is office, then these are the following effect sets that can happen. Okay, so here in this effect set, you will no longer have coffee, no longer have a request for coffee, I mean, you will no longer be carrying coffee, you'll no longer, there will not be a request for coffee and you are no longer in the mail room I guess. Okay, those three would be the effect with 0.19 probability. So this corresponds to one deterministic strips action. A different deterministic strips action is this. And this happens with 0.76 probability. Now if I tell you this is happening, then you know how to apply the strips action. You start with the original state variables valuations and change only these guys values and keep everybody else constant, everybody else as before. Yes. So the labels of a path from the root to a table are, can be thought of as a precondition. These are like the conditional effects, sort of. They're like the conditional effects telling you which, so if in fact, so for the same outcome, there may be different probabilities based on whether you got to that outcome through this path or a different path. Okay, so this one is essentially saying, so, so the, what they're capturing is that the probability uh, that these guys will take different valuations depends on what the current values are here, original values are here. Okay, so you converted that, this whole this presentation into, so if you had coffee and location is office, then these are the disjoint effect sets that you will have. Okay. And so, and then this will add up to one probability. And similarly, if this is true and location is anything other than office, then you have this set of probabilities and they'll again add up to one. If not, then you have this, which again adds up to one. So this one single action here really corresponds to all these strips. Um, this is basically, so, so if you just do this, this is one unconditional probabilistic strips operator. Okay, and then this one is a separate uh, strips operator. This is a sorry, this is a separate probabilistic strips operator. And this one is a separate one, and each probabilistic strips operator corresponds to 
a conjunction essentially of multiple deterministic strips operators with different probabilities. Okay, and so this is your representation, and you know this is actually the one. So in some sense, this is a compiled version of this. You wind up in some cases, you will wind up having this be much larger than this representation. But to the extent you like strips representations where you are directly told, you are directly told what the effect <coughs> set is with what probability, then you might like this. Okay, and in particular, actually. Um, the PPDDL representation is like that. The PPDDL representation, the standard uh, for the probabilistic PDDL essentially uses probabilistic strips operator uh, representation. Okay, so in essence they will provide you, I, you know, I think there's a link, did I give you a link to the PPDDL standard? If not, I'll send you one. But uh, Essentially, they will allow you the ability to write these sets of effects, the probabilistic sets of effects, okay, in, in a normal strips operator. Okay. Um, in fact, there is just as even now there is there is controversy between let's say the planning community on one hand and reasoning with actions community on the other as to whether you should use strips representation for actions or something else, like more like situation calculus. One is more expressive, one is probably faster to handle. Okay, The same kind of discussions continue in the probabilistic uh, action representations. Uh, so there are people who actually like this much more than they like this. And in fact, the next probabilistic planning competition uh, that's going to be held, I guess, next year, the guy who's running it, Scott Sanner, he likes the 2TBN representation much more than the PSO representation. So he's been threatening to change the PPDL standard such that it will directly support 2TBN representation. Okay, um, so that's that's where we are. But anyway, as far as I, for now, I think both are useful for you to understand that the transition function corresponding to an action, it can be represented in a factored form either this way or this way. Is it just a personal preference essentially as to which one? No, I think this one actually you can argue that this one is more expressive. Just as you can argue that the situation calculus representations are more expressive um, than strips representations for actions. So the trade-offs are almost the same. You know, one is easier to handle uh, during, uh, during uh, uh, planning but makes the life of the writer, the domain writer harder. One is easier for the domain writer to provide. This one is easier for the domain writer to provide, but it requires actually full-scale base network inference during even something as simple as plan projection. Do you see what I'm saying? So that's the same thing in, in a situation calculus too. So a situation calculus is much more expressive, but even to figure out what happens after a number of actions, you essentially need to do theorem proving. Okay. Um, but you know, whereas a strips representation does not, uh, you know, require you to, you know, think about. Basically, it cuts down the um, frame axioms by compiling them directly <coughs> in, and so you just know what the next state is. Okay, so that's the same idea, and again, just as that problem is occurring in in the, in the that that um, trade-off has been, you know. Has, has been a subject of controversy in the in the deterministic case. It's also a subject of controversy in the probabilistic case. Okay, but suffice it to say that both of these are at you know at, at, at the you know much higher level of abstraction than writing um, these as the action representations, which is what you would be doing if you don't have any factored representations. Okay. So, so this is a PPDL representation for an example. Here are some uh, domains, just to give you an idea. I mean, of course, many. One of the things that is not obvious until you actually try to write a domain in a representation is how bad that representation is, right? Um, so this is why I was suggesting for that as one of the mini projects is for you guys to come up with what you think is a planning domain in English and then try to write it in PDDL. And then you might realize that, oh my god, it seems like a very awkward thing to write it in this particular standard. 
okay? And the same thing can happen in PPDDL. So to actually understand, you know, what kind of domains can be written in this type of description, you know, here are some examples. Uh, basically, these were all used in the first probabilistic planning competition and there are others that were used afterwards. And uh, this one is essentially a probabilistic blocks world. Uh, the noise is that once in a while the blocks may slip onto the table when moved. Okay, and then this one is a colored blocks world. Uh, basically, the domain, the, the, the goals can be more interesting. Instead, of, in, Basically, the difference between this and this is here you would say put A on top of B on top of C. Here you would say um, put a red on top of blue on top of green. Now any red can take the red's place. Any blue can take the blue's place. Any green can take the green's place. Now that is actually a sort of an existential goal. So there exists a red block and a green block and a blue block such that you have the red on top of blue on top of green. Okay, which actually makes it a slightly harder search problem, believe it or not, because many planners then need to figure out which particular goal state are they trying to go towards. Okay, um, again in this case too, the only noise is blocks may slip. Their colors don't change. So the color aspect is only to make the search harder. Um, the only pro stochastic problem is that the blocks may slip when you try to put them on something. Okay. And then there is a box world here. Apparently, the box world that you can get lost driving, get lost during driving, and you may go to the wrong neighbor, in, neighbor in, in, you know, delivering the blocks. Uh, this one is an interesting case. This is exploding blocks world, and <coughs> what happens is the first block when you put it on the table, it might just explode. It might just explode with some probability. Now, what that essentially means is so basically the table has some evil property. So as soon as you put the first block on the table, it might just explode. Now if the block that exploded is the block that is supposed to take an important part in the goal, right, then you can't solve the problem anymore. Okay? Which is why you have infantry blocks, you know, just like infantrymen in, you know, in army where, you know, all the infantrymen go and get killed and then, you know, generals will say, yeah, now we can walk in and talk. Uh, similarly, you can put, uh, you know, sacrificial blocks first on the table and then let them get exploded. And after that, you start putting uh, the real blocks. Okay. The interesting thing is that of these four domains, this is the only one that is non-ergodic. Okay. I don't know whether we talked about ergodic in the class, but, you know, it's a very fancy term, um, which is worth remembering. Ergodic basically means you can, a domain is considered, a world is considered ergodic if the, you can reach any state in this world from any other state in this world with non-zero probability. That's all ergodic means. Okay, what that basically means is that you can never paint yourself into an irrevocable failure. I mean, you can't get into an irrevocable failure. You know, whatever happens, you can always come back to the normal, um, you know, states. Okay, uh, all these worlds are ergodic because at best when you're trying to put the block on, it'll fall down, so you'll put it back again, then it'll fall down some more times, and after a while it'll stand. Okay, so you can reach any state from any state. A non-ergodic domain, on the other hand, is a very tricky beast um, because uh, you could do an action that will get you into an irrevocable failure and after that there is, you know, your options are cut off. Okay, and um, so one of the interesting things is that if you have a non-ergodic domain, uh, online decision making is, has to be very careful. Online essentially means you do an action and see how things turn out and do the next action. If you are doing that and if the domain is non-ergodic, then the action that you did probably just killed you. So you really want to simulate this whole evolution in your head, find the optimal plan and start executing it. Okay, so it's interesting that after at least the four domains here, only one was non-ergodic. So keep that in mind. Um, and you know, it's not surprising because it's not very clear whether or not uh, realistic domains must be all non-ergodic. Okay, the world we live in 
is pretty much ergodic. We, if it wasn't originally, we make it ergodic. So that it's hard for us to get into, I mean, except for death, you know, uh, it's hard for us to get into an irrevocable failure. Okay, you mess up in the midterm, you'll get, you, you can go and whine and get extra credit or something and then still continue towards the final. Okay, um, but just a second. So, but it is true that the big, you know, really mean domains, mean worlds will be non-ergodic. And those are the ones where if you haven't thought clearly, you know, and you do a quick action, you die fast. Yes. Um, suppose you have a non-ergodic domain. Are there heuristics that are either built into planners or that you can embed in the description itself that will change it to an ergodic domain? Um, you could, no, not the heuristics, but sometimes you make domains ergodic. Okay, so for example, this is what I say that this is called, what you call is what's known as stabilizing the environment. Stabilizing the environment. Okay, so it may well be that the overall domain is actually non-ergodic, but you stabilize at least a piece of it such that it's ergodic. Okay, and that's what you do when you put kids in in your you know when you have kids in in your home, you put you know plastic things everywhere into the, all the electric outlets and try you know put large number of pillows everywhere um, you know and uh, to make sure that they don't bump themselves and. To make sure that they won't get badly, you know, um, um, badly injured or something. Okay, so you stabilized your home such that even though outside of the home cars can come and hit kids, as long as you close the doors, you know, this kid is going to be in a reasonably stabilized ergodic environment. So for that the, you could do. So for this particular exploding blocks, what we had a constraint that said, don't put a gold block on the table in the initial run. That would be an example of stabilizing the environment. Yes, if you do that, yeah. And if you could learn that heuristically, that's a different story too. That's fine too. But you know, you can also just stabilize the environment up front and then the remaining problems are all easy to solve. Okay, but again, to, to some extent, notice that changing the domain by actually doctoring the preconditions and effects is basically, I mean, if you ever change the preconditions and effects of an action, you change the domain. If you just said, when you are in this state, don't take this action, that's a heuristic. Okay, an optimal policy can work even in non-ergodic domains. That's what I was saying last time, that just because you are in, I mean, that was my whole point of reachability is always defined with respect to an optimal policy. Okay, um, just because you are near Grand Canyon doesn't mean you must fall into it. You know, you, if you know what actions to do, you know, if you computed the optimal policy up front, then that would essentially make sure that you won't fall in, if there is a way of not falling in. Okay? Uh, but if you do not compute the optimal policy, especially if you're doing online decision making, and I, that's interesting because FF Hub is actually, for example, doing online decision making, you know, those kinds of things can be tricked into doing wrong things this way, in these kinds of domains. Okay? Um, and then there are other worlds, tile world, tire world, tower of Hanai, and you know, etc. And then they, they have different kinds of noise. Um, as far as I know, I think uh, there is one other world in some other worlds that later on were added in the next uh, instances, but the first one probably this is the only one that was non ergodic Okay. Um, so now, how was the IPPC? So suppose you have these kinds of problems. In, you know, there are problems in all these domains and uh, you give it to the planner, you know, the competitors, and they're supposed to solve this. The question is, how are you going to evaluate them? Okay, these are planners. Normally, in deterministic planning competition, you just evaluate the plan itself directly. You evaluate the plan itself, and you say, you know, how many actions are there in your plan? And the guys who come up with fewer number of actions, the guys who come up with uh, uh, lower cumulative action, uh, cost of the actions, they will all get better points than the planners which will come with more actions and redundant sets of actions. Okay. Um, however, uh, however, uh, 
because this is probabilistic planning scenario, you can actually, uh, and in the deterministic case, essentially, there is not much to talk about executing the plan in the real world. Because when you execute the plan in the real world, it will work exactly how it is supposed to work. Because it's deterministic plan, in, in, and you're assuming that the underlying world is deterministic too. So there was nothing about execution for evaluating deterministic planners. By definition, it's a deterministic domain. So if you think, if you have a proof that this plan works, yes, it works there. Whereas in the probabilistic scenarios, you actually have execution is dependent on the plan, but you could be lucky. And so a bad plan may still execute well. Right? And so you can evaluate two different things in particular. One, you know, so how to compete, sorry. So the evaluations that they were looking at essentially were actually, so rather than compute, comp you know, compare the quality of the policies that individual planners came up with, which would be what you would have done if you did it just like the deterministic planning competition. So you would look at the policy quality and then see this guy who had a much better policy gets more points than this guy who got less better policy. Instead, since the execution is important here, what they actually did, they came up with is, uh, they chose one metric, which is, um, all we care about is not how well you plan, but how well you execute it. Okay, um, and so what that means is, uh, we'll tell you what the state, initial state is, you tell us what you want to do. <coughs> we, we tell you upfront what your goals are. And we'll tell you what the initial state is. You tell us what you want to do. We will simulate your action in the real world and we'll tell you what just happened. Then you tell us what you want to do. Then we'll tell you what the state is. Then you tell us what you want to do. Then we'll tell you what the state is. As this is going on, once in a while you might get to a state where no actions can be done anymore. In which case you fail. You can also get to a state where the goals are true. That means you succeeded. And we will count the number of actions you did to reach the goal state. And that would be one trial. And we'll do multiple trials and then see on the average how many actions are you doing. I mean, how often are you actually reaching the goal state, which is the probability of reaching the goal. And how long, how many actions are you doing to reach the goal state. Those are the two things that we will focus on in the competition. Now, of course, one question is that, you know, uh, there has to be some sort of a time limit, otherwise I'll give you initial state and then you'll take three days to come up with the action to do. So instead what they do is they will say um, 15 minutes, uh, so, so, so you have to, I think there's a total amount of time uh, for solving this problem is only 15 minutes. And you get to try 30 times in those 15 minutes. Okay, so the total time that you have both for thinking and execution is held constant. Okay, now the assumption of course is that when you do something in the world, the, inst the feedback is instantaneous. So that doesn't take any time. All the time is spent in actually coming up with what you want to do. Okay, and so what they actually did to, you know, to, to simulate the real world, uh, giving the feedback is they essentially let the planners send there's an API to some servers running somewhere, you know, in this case, CMU and Rutgers were running, those were the guys who were running the competition. Um, and so you send your action name and uh, they'll send you the state. You send your action name, they'll send you the state. And the state would be described in terms of, in this state, this, variable, this state variable has this value, this state variable has this value. So they don't say S75, they'll tell you that block A is clear, block B is clear, block C is on top of, uh, I mean block B is on top of block C and so on. So they actually describe the state completely for you. Okay? So this is supposed to be the evaluation in this competition. Now the question is, how do you compete? Now that you know the rules of the game, how do you compete? Now basically, you can think up front and then execute in the end, or you can Think a little, execute a little, think a little, execute a little. At least two options. Okay. Um, so those are the two ones I showed you here. One is offline policy generation followed by online execution. Okay. So in the first case, basically you get you go get the initial state, 
then essentially you know the initial state, you know the goal state, you know the action description in PPDDL. So you have an effective MDP right now. You can compute the optimal policy for that MDP. Once you compute the optimal policy or an approximation to the optimal policy for MDP, then you have a big table of saying this state, this action, this state, this action. So now you can just sit back and then say, yeah, you know, here is my, now that I know I'm in the state, initial state SI, okay, here is the action AI. So then they'll come and say you are in S75 and they'll describe what S75 is. And then you'll say, well, my action is A14. And then you will say the next action, next state and you'll get the next action. Okay, so this is actually you directly executed your optimal policy. Directly executed your optimal policy and all this will do is if you run this 30 times then in essence, um, I mean if, if, if you run it multiple times then you are essentially getting an average value of this optimal policy, expected value of this optimal policy. And you know that the whole point of optimal policy is it will have the highest expected value among all other policies. So you couldn't go wrong if you do it this way, right? But what you can go wrong is you can take forever doing the policy computation. If MDP is small, this can work. If the MDP is large, this basically is impossible to do, okay? So uh, you can actually see this also as, as I said, MDP is actually a special case of um, min-max game play. So if you're playing chess with somebody, right, you could go ahead and, you know, just before you even start the game, think up an entire strategy. Okay, this is going to be my first move and if the, if the, the board position is this, this would be my move. If the board position is this, this would be my move. Now if you computed the entire strategy, then you just, you know, basically at that point, you know, after you computed the strategy, just executing it is it's only the opponent who is taking time to make their moves. You are just making moves like instantaneously because you know what the optimal strategy is. You computed all possible, you know, uh, for all possible board positions what your optimal least risk action is. Clearly, we, you know, that's what we try when we talk about game tree search. The first idea would be to do min-max search all the way down and then find the action. And then we realize that's not going to happen most of the time. And so you do online decision making. Okay, so this one is offline idea where, and the thing about this is this directly allows you to use all the MDP value policy iteration and efficient MDP value policy iteration algorithms directly as just subroutines of this. So you do the planning first, then execution. Okay, notice that in deterministic planning, this is what you would do anyway. Okay, um, the other option of course is you're wasting, you know, it's, you know, since there may not be enough time to compute the entire optimal policy and also it's possible that in a particular, um, particular execution, you may only need to know certain neighborhoods that are, you know, that are close by to you to see what you're supposed to do in those particular states, okay, rather than look at the entire MDP. So, what you can try to do is uh, both because there is not because of the resource limitation and uh, because of the fact and also because you don't really want to solve the entire MDP just to solve one problem um, you might consider online selection okay, online action selection there in a sense what you're doing is you do a little bit of thinking pick an action for the current state do it and then wait for, just as in you know chess game, you wait for your opponent to tell you what the next, what, what the board position is. Now you wait for the server to tell you what happened to the world now that you did this action. It's not what you necessarily expect it to happen, right? You think that after this action, the world could be in one of 18 different configurations. But only one of them actually happens. Okay, and so uh, you do that and you will get that information. So you then, starting from that state, if you are in this state and you need to reach the goal state, what's the best action to do? You do that again. This is online decision making, okay? And the advantages here are, the, on the offline one, you can anticipate all problems up front and do, you know, probably optimal policy will be constructed. Um, but on the, the negative side is, it might just take too much time to start executing. 
and so you might get run over by the truck while you are thinking, you know, looking for the optimal policy. Okay, um, and this side it provides a fast first response. Okay, uh, but it might paint itself into a corner, especially if the domains are non-ergodic. And if the domains are ergodic, then it will only be less optimal than the optimal policy. If it's non-ergodic, it actually could have infinitely bad quality because it can die, right? So that's your, uh, and now again, these are reasonable things to be able to do in, in, in a stochastic world. Either you can think up front and start doing, or you do online you know, decision making. And online decision making actually is useful either because it's a stochastic world and you're too lazy to compute the optimal policy, or because it is actually a dynamic uh, multi-agent world, and you don't have the information to compute the optimal policy. In each case, you do something and let the other people come. Okay, um, so these were the two options, and uh, what happened in the first IPPC is most IPPC competitors tended to be in the first option because they are all coming from the MDP literature, they are all planning people, so they tended to essentially generate a whole bunch of uh, um, different kinds of techniques for completely, completely um, optimal, um, optimally solving an MDP or suboptimally solving an MDP and they just use it during the execution period. Okay, um, that's what they did and one group who also actually came up with this, you know, compute the optimal policy and then execute it. <coughs> just as a sanity check, did what they thought was like a dumb idea, just so that, you know, you want to see whether you're doing slightly better than the dumb idea. Okay, and the dumb idea they tried was this idea called replanning. And what it did, essentially, is uh, take the domain and just completely determinize, get rid of probabilities. Okay. Um, if you get rid of probabilities, you can do it in two different ways. One way is, you know, for every action, pick the outcome that is most likely and just say nothing else will happen. That's one way of determinizing and that's called most likely outcome determinization. The other one is to say everything will occur. Every one of the effects of this action will occur. And to do that, basically you can just say that, I mean, they don't occur at the same time. It's just that, you know, so for example, when you have uh, here, for example, prop, uh, effect, probability 0.05 toilet clogged, then I essentially can convert this into two different actions. In one action, toilet would be clogged, another action, toilet won't be clogged. And both are part of the domain now. So since they are different actions, the planner can pick the good action. Do you see what I'm saying? Now the problem is that if it, nobody would pick the wrong action, if one action is going to make them fall down, the other action is going to get them to the goal. Nobody will pick the wrong action then. Oftentimes what happens is a single action that you do with some probability will make you fall down and with other probability get you to the goal. Like you know, you know, you are on the like very knife-edged rim of the Grand Canyon, right there is a candy and you know, you want to reach the candy by making a simple leap, you know, of faith. Um, and then with some probability you will be at the bottom of the canyon and with another probability you will reach the candy. You can't separate them. If you separate them into let me take the non-falling down action, let me take the falling down action, then if you still pick the falling down action that means you actually like falling down, not like candy. Okay. The reason it's actually a hard problem is because both of them come together. Now in the all outcome determinization, you convert them into two separate independent actions and you can pick each of them separately. Doesn't that explode the search space that you're going through significantly? Yeah, but it also makes the problem much simpler. Yes, it increases the number of actions, but it also makes the problems simpler. So it increases the B, but it can significantly reduce the D. <laughs> right? And it's B power D is the search space. Okay, so they tried, you know, in fact, originally they tried, uh, so come, so get the initial state, compute an optimal, sorry, not this one. Okay, so one group implemented a simple online replanning approach in addition to their offline policy generation. Um, 
which is what they were hoping will win, really. I mean, they had this very nice idea for offline policy generation involving policy rollout, which we may or may not get to. Okay, and uh, they just before they even took part in the competition, they wanted to make sure that their super smart idea is better than this dumb idea. Okay, and this dumb idea, as I said, was you know, determine the probabilistic problem. You could do it either most likely way or all outcomes way. Um, I think the first time they just did the most likely, and later on they did all outcomes. Um, and then in a loop, get the state, call. Now this, since you determinize this, you have a deterministic domain. Okay, so if you give an initial state and a goal state, you can call FF to solve the problem. Okay, and it will solve the problem and say if you do these actions from this state, you will get to the initial state if the world works according to your will and wish. Then you do the first action of this sequence. If you really thought you were the god of this world, then you will just do first, second, third, fourth, fifteenth action of the sequence and say, I am done. I have reached the goal. Okay. Since you don't consider yourself the god, you just want to wish that the world is nice to you, you do this the first action. And let them tell you what happened after the first action. So basically, get the state, call the classical panel with SG as the problem, execute the first action of this prob problem, and then loop back, where you again get the state. Starting from this new state, you can, you can completely ignore the old plan. You know, as far as theoretically speaking, okay, just compute this new plan again from this state, and then take the first action. You can see clearly that you can do all sorts of improvements to this. For example, if you are that lucky, maybe the second state is exactly what you expected in the current plan to be. So imagine the following uh, happened. So suppose, suppose you had. Uh, you had originally initial state SI to goal G, and you came up with A1, A2, etc., AK as the plan. And you went out and say, okay, I want to do A1 now. Okay, and then uh, then the the simulator said, well, your state is S10 now. Okay. Now the interesting question is, uh, if you are really lucky, maybe S10 is what you expected after A1. In which case, you don't need to do anything further, just do A2. Okay, this much you can do. Can you do slightly better than that? So remember that, you know, even here you could have just said, well, so you say S10, I'll solve the problem S10 to G. Now, the deterministic problem S10 to G, and then find the next act, the first action for that, and if, you know, it may well be A2 is the first action, and you just find it after wasting some time. If you realize that S10 is the expected state here, according to the deterministic semantics, then you will just do A2. Okay, so what else can I do now that I have this plan, what else can I do? Yes. Um, I mean, before going off to solve a new problem. It, you can look at whether the state was reached anywhere. Exactly. Exactly, because you could be even luckier, <laughs> right? I mean, why do you think you will, after doing A1, only S10 will occur? Maybe you are so lucky that you reach the goal state. Right? Okay. Um, I mean, you know. <laughs> um, so, the nature is like positively trying to help you. I mean, you know, there are a couple of Indians here. And, you know, I've seen when, in, when I was a kid, I used to see these mythological movies where in, in Indian uh, mythologies, all the all the, uh, you know, wars are done with the bow and arrow, right? We haven't invented Smith and Wesson at that time. Um, and so when you, you know, when you throw a, an arrow at somebody, then if the guards are trying to help you, they will slowly guide the arrow. Even though this is the guy you want to hit and you're so stupid that you're doing it this way, the guards will try to push this to come and hit this guy. Okay? So that's the kind of nature helping you. And normally that happens to the hero of the mythology because the heroes should win, okay? And so that could happen to you too. You know, some lord is helping you right after your first action. They said, okay, I'll get you both. And if you're stupid, <laughs> then you won't think, oh, I should not be done yet. Let me just now take this next state and apply, you know, try to solve it. So in general, actually, the simplest idea is Essentially, any of the states that appear 
on this sequence, you know what action to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. And so when you do when you do the action A1 and they come up with S10, you actually, as soon as you make a plan, the best thing to do is to write down a partial policy. And the partial policy says if you are in S10, do A2. If this, let's say this is S13. If it is S13, do A4. Blah blah blah. If you are S95, um, say success. Okay, so then you can throw this plan out. When the new state comes, you look up this partial policy to see if the state that you gave, that you got, you lucked out and it's already kind of, you know, seen before. You see what I'm saying? In which case, you just pick the action corresponding to that and do it. Now, what's interesting is that suppose you actually, um, turns out that suppose you actually, um, you got S19, it turns out that if you do some action A4 to S19, you can get to S10. That means, in essence, you know, when you are replanning, you don't have to replan to just the goal state. Any of the states that you know how to get to are all goal states. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you can reach them, then you have reached the goal state. May not be the optimal way, but you will certainly reach the goal state. Okay, this can cut down the amount of FF calls you would do. This can cut down the amount of FF calls you do. And I don't know if any of you have read the Goth paper uh, uh, that I also gave, but basically the ideas in Goth paper are a logical culmination of these kinds of ideas. So keep track of the valuation of a state if the exact same state comes, comes again next time, you know what its state is. If you get a state which is sort of similar enough to one of the existing states, then you can try to approximate its value based on, you know, the known values of the existing states that you have visited before. Okay, that will basically cut down the number of times you'd have to call the underlying deterministic planner. You know, deterministic planning is cheaper than stochastic planning, but deterministic planning is not exactly a cakewalk either. It's piece space complete too. Okay, in the very first idea of our FF replan, they just went ahead every time, solved the problem from scratch, more or less. Okay, and they were just trying to see we can do better than this. You know, all of you have written papers where you want to come up with a baseline solution which is worse than your solution, very badly worse, so that you can easily show that you are at least better than that loser. Okay, now what happened unfortunately for them, and unfortunately also, I mean, maybe fortunately for the community, is uh, that this strawman planner won the competition. He just won the competition, not just over their plan, not, not just over their approach, but over everybody's approach. Okay, remember what it meant by winning the competition is that it won this evaluation. And you should not be surprised that it won this evaluation because, for example, there is a time limit and people who tend to overthink might actually just do one action and die after all the thinking. Okay, and furthermore, while doing actions quickly could be bad, could be bad, it also ensures uh, if you are actually working in these kinds of domains which are essentially non, I mean, which essentially are mostly ergodic, you can always get back on track. Okay, so in retrospect, it all makes sense. But, you know, imagine the surprise of the people who were there in 2006 competition and I even, you know, made this joke that, you know, there's this thing, I may have mentioned it to you guys, that I once saw a t-shirt say, which said, uh, 25 years of research into programming languages and C++ is the result, question mark. Okay, and so we made a version of that, we wanted to make a version of that saying uh, 20 years of research into decision theoretic planning and FF replan is the result in the sense that that's the one winning competition because, you know, clearly that basically means all the guys who try to do MDP optimal policy are basically, at least by this competition, are wasting their time. Yes? From what I understand, the metric the competition is evaluating is you're trying to find a planner that on average gives you the shortest plan 
to achieve the goal. Right? That they did both. Actually, I mean, you know, they did um, shortest. Uh, you know, I, they did basically average reward a planner got. And the way they did was the value that a plan got is the actual costs which are negative plus 500 per goal for reaching the goal. Okay, so if you do too many actions and to the actions to the extent actions have costs, you will reduce from reaching the goal. If you didn't reach the goal, you only have a negative cost, negative value. That's what they were doing. Okay, um, so so then basically the lots of hand wringing after that maybe we should require that the planners really really use probabilities. It's like who allowed this non-probabilistic planner into a probabilistic planning competition? You should not have allowed it. You know they should not be allowed to win, right? Um, uh, or the replanning approach is just, so are uh, that maybe the domains are wrong. Maybe we should improve the domains such that these kinds of bad guys will never win the competition, right? Um, and in fact, there's actually a paper, you know, by uh, that I'll probably forward it to you, but it's listed, it, it's cited in the FF Replan, FF Half paper, which basically says uh, on probabilistically interesting domains, which depending on who reads it, you can say that they're saying, hint, hint, probabilistically interesting means the planners with the right color, you know, the non um, non-deterministic, not the deterministic ones, the probabilistic ones, which can solve this, which kind of makes no sense. You know, it should the difficulty of a problem should depend upon who is solving it, right? And so you need to understand. I mean, to some extent, the way I presented this here, you probably should not be too surprised that FF Replan one, it was a uh, it was a, a function of both the kind of domains and the. Uh, and, and the fact that these other guys probably were taking way too much time trying to compute the policy. And if you're not smart, and if you actually um, compute the entire MDP, just on the way to computing the optimal policy for that MDP, you're dead already. Before even the bell rang, you're dead. Okay? There was a question somewhere. Yes? Is this the one by Little and Thiebo, the probabilistically interesting? That's the paper, yes. Yeah, and you know, I mean, there was a lot of hand wringing. You know, you have to understand that basically a lot of people up until then, essentially, there was probabilistic planning people who talked to each other in MDP lingo. There was deterministic planning people who talked to each other in relaxed planning graph lingo, and they would never talk to each other. They would just pass by. You know, if there is like a in the conference, there is a table for buffet. Those people are on that side. These people are on this side. Once in a while, glare and move on. Okay. And now suddenly you are saying that they have to talk to each other because they are both in the same competition. In fact, one of these guys won their competition, quote unquote. Okay? I'm maybe probably over dramatizing it, but you know, at least for this community, it was a big enough deal. Um, so what uh, the FF plan, FF hub, that paper that you read sort of comes in this context. This is the you know, background of that. And in fact, the guys who tried the FF plan is Sangu Kyun. Um, Alan Fern and Bob Given, who actually came up with their own idea called policy rollout, which is a, an interesting approximate approach for computing optimal policies. And they were going to use this offline. But then, you know, this online brain dead approach one. Now, the interesting thing is you could uh, make sense of why FF plan works essentially by saying that all it's doing is sampling a non a stochastic world and using deterministic techniques to handle that stochastic world. Nobody said you cannot use deterministic techniques to handle stochastic worlds. Samples are deterministic by definition. And what FF how can be seen as is as doing sampling on stochastic worlds. And to understand that, um, it would be useful to understand a slightly different kind of problem where you have deterministic domain, okay, let's say blocks world domain, but the goals are coming. I mean, so normal planning assumes you're giving the initial state and the goal state, and you do the actions, you reach the goal state, you're done. Suppose I come up with a different kind of problem, where you never die, you're never done, ever, okay? It's a deterministic domain, um, I just keep giving you more and more homeworks to do. Okay, more and more goals are coming. 
and these goals are coming like there's a goal today, there's a goal tomorrow, there's a goal day after tomorrow, and sometimes there are two goals on the same day, um, and there is some distribution with which these goals are being added to the thing that you need to do. I mean, you all have to-do list, right? I'm assuming that most of us like to believe that we live in reasonably deterministic worlds, and your to-do list is really your goal list, and you are constantly making your plans to, you know somehow handle all those goals, reprioritizing them and trying to handle all those goals. Right? Now if you do that, there, there is uncertainty. Right? The uncertainty is not about what happens when you do an action. The uncertainty is about what else will happen tomorrow, what other goals will come. Right? Suppose you have, essentially, suppose you have like two ways of solving this goal. Suppose there is like a um, I mean, so basically, it, it's possible that if you don't know all the goals in advance and the goals can keep coming slowly, you may not want to use up all your resources on the first goal itself. Okay, because maybe the second goal will come with a much higher reward and you would have wished that you kept some of the resources. You, you, you would have wished that you took partial credit on the first goal and used the extra resources on the second goal. Right? Now, here is a situation where you have a deterministic planning problem which has uncertainty that is exogenous. That means that uncertainty comes because the goals are coming. It doesn't know how many goals will come up front. How would you solve such a problem? First of all, this kind of a thing happens all the time. Right? I mean, in, you know, we, are, we will talk about the difference between planning and scheduling more formally later. But really the difference is, in the case of scheduling, somebody has I mean, decided the actions to be done, you are just trying to decide which resources are given to what actions. In the case of planning, you also have to come up with the actions and then provide the resources. Now, you can have uh, both a version of this problem either for planning or for scheduling. Right? Uh, so, generally when um, you are a restaurant guy and people are coming in and you are trying to seat them, um, you are basically trying to decide if there is these two people here, there is a eight people table, should we make them wait a little longer and, and, and maybe risk losing them from the restaurant, okay, uh, so that a two people table will open up and you can put them there or should we just put them in the eight people table in which case the eight people are, you know, little later eight people will show up and they have to wait forever and ever because there is no eight people table other than this one. Right? And if you are like uh, one of these well-dressed people who see people in the restaurants, you're doing anticipatory schedule. Right? Uh, you are thinking that maybe eight people will come and so if it's like a particularly slow day and you're going to close at 10.30 and I stand with my friend at 10.29, okay, and there is only one table open and that's an eight people table and you still say wait and then actually close the door on me because now it's 10.30, okay? Then I'll never ever ever again go to this restaurant. So expected loss is much higher. Whereas if I showed up at seven o'clock, you know, probably it makes more sense to wait because there's a, you know, a bigger group might come and so it's okay to make this guy a little unhappy. Okay, now how do you solve? So basically we do this all the time. We solve these problems both in scheduling and planning all the time and the uncertainty is exogenous from outside. And the way actually these problems get solved, one way of solving them essentially is to, if you don't know how the goals come, then you really can't do much. Okay, but if you know um, how the goals come, I mean in fact I think there is this joke that people keep saying so that, uh, I once heard that you, know, you go to a you know, five star hotel uh, in, in like middle of the night and then you want a room and they don't have a room they'll say. Okay, you say, but don't you have a presidential suite? They say, yes. Yeah, I know that president isn't coming today, so you can give it to me. Okay, so so I'm telling you that you don't need to keep it. You know, I'm, I know that Obama is not showing up today, so you can give me the suite that you kept for him, you know, and I'll get it. Um, so the basic idea is when you're doing anticipatory scheduling, if you know something about the distribution of arrival of goal requests, you can use that to decide what is the best allotment, best allocation, best action to do. Okay, in particular what actually 
um, this, this kind of anticipatory planning and scheduling does is uh, if you have a distribution of the goal arrival, then sample goes up to a certain horizon using this distribution. Now, if you are a meter day in a hotel, then probably you want to kind of like kind of sample what's the likelihood of people coming in the next half an hour. What kinds of people will come in the next half an hour, given the distribution I know of the people's arrival. Okay, and then let's assume they actually come. So uh, the samples become the real goals now. So then I make the plan for this half an hour, correct plan or correct schedule for this half an hour, and use the allocation using that. So the virtual goals will still not be allocated, but the real goals which are waiting for me will get their allocation based on the possibility of these particular virtual goals coming. And if you want to improve the accuracy of your allocation, you want to do more samples of the possible evolution of the whole future and see which actions seem to work out in most futures. This is basically called the anticipatory algorithms and uh, you know, it's a, a well-known literature you know, idea. Uh, just a second. And all FFHOP does is uses the same exact idea, except now in FFHOP's case, the goals are set up front. So the uncertainty is not exogenous. What is exogenous is the actions. I'm sorry, what is uncertain is actions. When you do an action, you know, you can go here or here. Right? And so in some sense, it's not surprising that you could essentially, I mean, you can see both of these are about uncertain words. In one case, uncertainty is about the goals. Here, the uncertainty is about the action outcomes. Now, the interesting question is, if the goals are arriving in some probabilistic fashion, right, then you would sample the goal arrival to decide the future up to a particular horizon, and then you'll get a deterministic problem where you already have deterministic dynamics, and you now also have deterministic goals, and you just have to solve them. Okay, now in this case, in the FFHOP's case, you already have deterministic goals. You know what your goal is up front. Okay, what you don't have is deterministic actions. So when you sample, you have to sample the outcomes of the actions. So you would say that today I'll assume that <coughs> action one will give the 15th outcome, action two will give the 17th outcome, action three will give the 45th outcome. I would assume, I 